This is the Thursday OGM weekly call for Thursday, August 20, August 4th, 2022. I don't know how we made it into August so quickly, but here we are. Um, and our format today is just check-in, sort of round robin. Uh, Dave, no intention to put you on the spot, but you're here occasionally, and I would love to uh, see if you want to jump in first so we can catch up with you, and then maybe we'll go uh, cover the two dogs. And Dave, you might still be setting, setting yourself up. I don't know. I can't see you because there's no video coming yet. And we don't hear you. Before. There was a video before, so something must have happened. I think Dave has slipped into a different dimension. Um, okay, let's go Doug B, then Doug C, and we'll come back to Dave. So actually, uh, OGM was evoked a dozen times over the last week in my world. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> nice. I hope in good ways. Yeah, it, all, all good. All good. Um, you know, there's the, you know, the little kid in the back of the car. Are we there yet? It's either so, that or we want ice cream. Or I yeah. got a pee. Or yeah. I got a pee. Good point. Totally. <laughs> or I got a pee. So, you know, there's sort of an adult version of the same thing in OGM like circles. And um, there are all these, there are these parallel facets that I've been trying to get arms around between doing and um, sharing and connecting and understanding and whether we're capable of doing more than one of those at a time, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had somebody, I invoked the word meta as, the, as you know, the, this question. And he sort of turned the tables and said, actually, it's a, that's a proto um, inquiry. It's actually underneath, under all of those dimensions, um, why, um, why is it so challenging to have multiple, those multiple dimensions all converging at the same place, same time in sorting and sifting what the collective will and energy and attention is, is being devoted to. And so that's, that's my share and, and that's my wrestle. <laughs> and I don't know whether it's a value add for anybody else, but, um, that's that's what's living for me these days. Thank you. Um, so into multitasking, I guess, which is a one generalization of one of the things you put on the table. Where do you end up? How do you feel about that? Do you feel like single-minded attention is important or essential, or 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 even the only possible thing, or something else? Um, well, as far as I've gotten which isn't far, um, I, I feel a huge sense of um, importance imperative that there be intentionality and choice. And, and how to get to that by and between multiple people co-creating together is just a really intractable challenge um, because the intentionality, the, fi the fire is there and in the choosing, um, each person has their hobby horse 
and and um, is it possible to transcend the hobby horse stage uh, and get to a place where everybody uh, sort of resets resets and and comes to an, a collective alignment? And how 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 can that be made to happen, or facilitated, or catalyzed, or supported um, to figure out what the it is? Mm -hmm. So that's the that's as far as I've gotten. Thanks, Doug. One of us has got a mic open and is typing really close to the microphone. We're hearing some typing in the background. So if you're not speaking, if you wouldn't mind uh, muting, uh, and Grace, and then Stuart. So yeah, I was in a meeting for a collaborative group this week, which I hadn't been to before and included a lot of the same faces and stuff. And I noticed that it wasn't one group there were a number of different directions that people were going into. And what Doug is pointing to is like, when can we like figure out the collaboration and start doing something together? And I don't think that that is the answer because um, I look at systems from a particular perspective and you know, I'm looking at monetary systems and I'm looking at the underlying interest, like the underlying economic infrastructure at the whole world. And only a few people need to do that. And only a few people are interested in that, thank God. And a lot of people need to walk old ladies across the street. And a lot of people need to do local food delivery. And a lot of people need to create local communities. And I don't see any imperative. And, you know, I look at what, uh, you know, like what Klaus is doing, for example. You know, he's totally into that farming, environmental, and food thing. And I don't know a damn thing about it. But somebody's got to do it. I'm so glad Klaus is doing it, right? Like, each one of us is doing the part we need to do. I don't seen any imperative to like align but I think I see an imperative for us to stop bullshitting ourselves about we're all on the same thing and we're all doing the same thing and going to these huge meta meetings you know you guys asked me last week why I come to this meeting it's the one meeting that I do this one of these meta meetings regularly and have been doing for several months because I like you guys and I want to hang out with some people like this but I'm not going to go to two or three of these a week there are a lot I, I but we just have to stop pretending that we're all working on the same thing because we're working in the same direction. And I think we need to, and I think that there is a shadow that's undistinguished with a lot of people about not really wanting to get anything done, like stepping on their own toes. I know I have that actually, I've been doing a little bit of energy work and I've noticed a lot of pain in my right foot and my, and my, teacher said, why do you keep stepping on your own foot? And that's my inquiry for the month. Like, what is it? Right. But I do think like a lot of the, there's certain people who you see in a lot of these meetings and it's just really clear that they're not committed to getting anything done. And that's okay too. Like that's okay with me. I'm not going to invite them to my team, but it's totally okay with me that there are people like that. Complete. Um, thanks Grace. And are there subgroups that are that might be trying to align to do something and how do we discover them and nurture them while not making assumptions like you just pointed out that hey we're all on exactly the same mission and need to sort of align around one thing so how do we how do we manage the tension of there being a few people with a lot more energy and who are in fact either seeking help from other people to, on their mission or would like to pour a lot of their energy into someone else's mission that whole thing how does that come out of the, the group or how does that form into a group like this? Well, I, I think that's an individual question. Like I personally don't hang out with those people and I have office hours twice a week. And that's how I help. If you're looking to come and get some information, if you're looking for some advice on your DAO or your organizational structure or whatever people think that I'm expert in, I don't know, people ask me all kinds of questions. People ask me, sex questions i'm like oh okay been single for a really long time but um <laughs> but you know like i'm here i don't and i think the answer of how do we as a group like i don't know like i'm gonna you know when i do my check-in you know i'm gonna be starting to hit you guys up the specific people of you that i think can be most useful to me and that's how we're all responsible for ourselves and what we need so that's a very individual one-on-one -on -one kind of approach, but we're kind of a group here. And I have a feeling that there's more groupy stuff we can do as opposed to, 
um, each of us drops in. And, and, and also I'll say that the Thursday calls have a different nature and character than I think most of the other calls in the week. This is just meant to be like a little heartbeat for the community where we're checking in. There's no mission statement around these calls, although we changed our format some months ago so that we alternate now between check-in and theme. Uh, but, but these calls are just meant to be like the stir and see who's around. So, so I think they're very much in the spirit of what you just said, Grace. But I think that there's, in, in, our, in our community of communities, our little flotilla of communities, there's a bunch of people trying to stand things up and make things work and make things happen who need the group organization, who need more, more stick to it. And maybe that just means they stand up a different call and attract people to that call. And, and the, the, the motive power is a bunch of different regular calls which attract different groups of people interested in different projects. And maybe that's, maybe that's the whole thing. I think a really useful thing to do would be use case. Talk to, you know, figure out who those people are that you're saying. There are people who, you know, whatever, whatever you said, Jerry, and talk to them and say, what is the use case? What would be the ideal thing for you? And write down those use cases and see if there really is something that's a something. Because my sense is that we do these things like mapping and networking and flotillaing and categorizing without having set out, okay, here's whatever, Vincent's a good example, right? He wants to do things. Here are the things that he, he wishes would happen, although, you know, like he just produces stuff. Maybe he's totally happy producing stuff, right? Like, you know, what would you like to happen, Vincent? Would you like somebody to take on what you finish? Would you like it, you know? And then I would interview those specific people and say, what is it? And what would be the end result? and then see what those use cases tell us. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Stuart, you had thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, but I oh, realized I didn't hear what the this was when it started. I just I just had a response to something that Doug was saying and also what, what Grace was saying. Um, and maybe I'll save those for the check-in, but unless you can clue me in on what started the conversation and what they were responding to. Well, hold your thought for a second and let me stay on what Grace had raised and see if anybody else would like to jump in. If not, let's just get back to you for what you were holding for Doug B. Anyone else? The uh, floor is yours, Stuart. Great. So in, in response to J Doug B and also about Grace, I watched this podcast yesterday um, out of uh, a colleague, Aviv Shahar, Portals of Perception. And he had a wonderful guest on, Julie Crow. And I really got in my body for the first time, because I know Doug and I have been talking about thinking about thinking, both Doug's, at, along with Stacy, the, 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 the idea of um, moving into uh, the opposite of a, of a dualistic world. The fact at a, at a very pr profound and deep level that we are all in this together. So it's congruent with Doug, what, what Doug said about working together and congruent with what Grace just said about finding, you know, we don't have to all do something together, finding the people who are doing things that you're interested in. But the bottom line is that, that behind that all is, and we've been so conditioned to think as individuals, but at, at this point in time where we are, we're all in this together. We're all in this super facing calamity together. And we're all either going to get out of it together or we're not. The idea of, of individuality, you know, that's that's the point of changing thinking, I think. That's the that's the critical piece when we look at massive uh, transformation. And like Grace says, but it starts with walking old old people across the street. Mm -hmm. Love that. Oh, Doug, thank you very much for remembering. Appreciate that. Um, Who's Julie Krull? Uh, so you mentioned at the start of what you were just commenting on, having this podcast with Julie Krull, was it, Stuart? Yes, K-R-U-L-L, -L, uh, Aviv Shahar, Portals of Perception. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Jim. you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Doug C. Yeah, you had me in the queue, and then somehow I dropped out. Uh, uh, we're not so, back in the queue, so you are now reestablishing the queue, and thank you. Good. <laughs> uh, 
what's been on my mind a lot is how we deal with this problem of getting a conversation that includes more than just a few of us uh, facing global problems that involve everybody. And it seems to me one of the leverage points that actually exists in the world is the algorithms that the major platforms are using to deliver content to people. And since the content they are delivering seems to be, if I read the literature right, mostly to raise the level of anger and antagonism, uh, making the situation more negative, what if we could reverse that? and switch the algorithm so they would provide everybody with something positive from where they are. Uh, and it would bias that way. And since we're talking about a lot of people that use things like Facebook, maybe it's one of the few leverage points that exist that could uh, affect a lot of people's thinking. Um, a couple of thoughts um, from me, and then let's see what other people think. Um, so first, I, I think it's a relatively, I'm going to say, cynical point of view to think that all the algorithms are only out there to fuel us up and make us angry. I think that they're most, many of the algorithms, from my perspective, are built for addiction. And what they really want is user minutes. They want us to stay on the platform so it'll watch more ads. And, and it turns out that some discovered that, boy, when we get people really heated up, they stay on longer, they get more addicted, and that leads directly to where you are. But I think some of these platforms have woken up and are trying very consciously to eliminate bias wherever, wherever they find it, to not create sort of addiction, but still to serve. And I may be naive in saying so, but I think that some are trying really hard to do something different. The second thing I'll say is these algorithms are unfortunately, the crown jewels of most of these companies and held very close. One of our problems is that the algorithms aren't public in any way. Uh, so if it was just that they were counting some, some knowable uh, set of widgets and then presenting the answer to that, that would be one thing. But also the moment the algorithm is public, you get a gaming of the algorithm, which is what happened before Google and PageRank. We had, you know, uh, that the standard standard practice in early web search engines with Alta Vista and whatnot was you would take metadata in your web page and you would load it up with search terms you wanted to hit and you would take micro font type and you would put that in your page all over the place to load up these words and and we've seen how that's just escalated into a series of industries and sub industries SEO SEM etc which are all busy all busy really hard working hard and getting paid well to game the algorithms that that you're putting in front of us Doug. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is um, there, maybe I have four things to say. The third thing is that there are some organizations actually worried about this and trying to work on it in public. And I'm forgetting exactly which ones, but uh, whether it's uh, Tristan Harris and the human tech, human tech stuff or others, there's a bunch of people who really care about this and are doing something whom we might be able to help. And then the fourth thing I'll say is, um, okay then, so if we want to stand up and do something about the algorithms, do we, what action would you like us to take? Should we stand up uh, 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 an initiative on, what was the, uh, I'm forgetting which, uh, which the, uh, the movement website was that, uh, that used to be really popular. Anyway, um, it'll come back to us in a sec. Uh, so, so what would you, Doug, what, what action could we take? Uh, should we kidnap the algorithm engineers and, and hold them for ransom until the algorithms are changed? I mean, there's, there's all different kinds of approaches to this kind of thing. Well, one qu question is kind of the sociology of this group, and I don't know the answer. How deep are our relationships and friendships into those organizations where with conversations we could begin to change the atmosphere? The other approach would be from the outside, that is to build a, a consumer demand uh, to move in that direction. And I just don't know the answer, uh, but you are swamping my proposal with a lot of words. Uh, uh, well, I'm, try I'm trying to take it seriously and say, hey, there's a lot of issues around this that are easy to point out. There are some orgs working on this already and let's see where it goes. And I think uh, Judy Grace and Michael have a, a bunch to add to the to this thread. So Judy, the floor is yours. I was just going to comment really on Grace's remarks because I totally agree that it's as an individual that each person first engages to identify something that they have personal energy to do. And then I've been looking quite a bit at 
how it moves from individual to small group to bigger group to movement. And, and it seems to me that, that there's some analytics there, but it tends to be that you start locally with individuals, you get some things going, you expand in your local community, and then it occurs to you that there might be people in other communities from whom you could learn or with whom you could share. And there's a dynamic there that we could pay more attention to in, in, able, in being able to assist at whichever stage a group is at if we have wisdom to offer. Thanks, Judy. And then that's something I've been interested in as well for, for a long time. So I agreed on that. Um, Grace and Michael. I just want to say something quick about the algorithm thread. I was thinking about these algorithms because they can't explain to you what they're doing. They're algorithms. So if you said, why did you show me that pair of, you know, whatever, slacks or boxers or whatever, they, they can't tell you why. It's, um, it's sometimes they're rule-based and sometimes they're not. So, so the, the ones that are rule-based can very much tell you when this word triggers, we play this ad or whatever, they're very explicit. And then others that are deep learning based are just patterns matching, patterns matching. And it's like a right. big black box with smoke inside. Right, and that's the majority of the very clever ones because the ones that are strictly rule-based, some human thought of them and they're pretty limited, but you know, what Amazon and Facebook and all the, you know, those are way too deep for them to actually be able to say something to. And I think of it a little bit like human psychology, right? Like we have these complexes and whenever I see somebody with a red shirt, I get a little bit nervous, but until I identify that that's the thing with me, right? You know, it, like that's the thing, right? And I think the, 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 but as a human, you can recognize that you have trauma and you can go to trauma therapy and you can kind of unravel that messed up psychology that you've got. You can see you're doing harm to other people and you can unravel that. And as an algorithm, you don't have any incentive to do that. And so I think it's a little bit like trying to fix the algorithms is almost impossible. It really requires to start anew. That's what I had to say about Thanks. that. Thanks, Grace. Uh, Judy, if you want to put your hand down from earlier, uh, unless you want to jump back in, and then Michael. Um, I'm just about to drop a few links in the chat, um, just for other words that, uh, some of which I mentioned and others of which um, people would want to know about. And I think Grace is, is really right about the fact that the algorithm, the algorithm, the algorithm is 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 not the way to be going at this. That you know, the the idea that we're going to achieve some kind of victory if um, if we can get somebody else to to shift the decisions they are making about what we see versus taking control of what we see you know, uh, somebody else tweaking algorithms that, that we don't control is not a solution. Um, and I mean, I, it's been a while since I used this metaphor in this group, but, you know, it, if you think about what you feed your mind, the way you think about what you feed your body, it's as if right now our food comes to us for free Every time we open our refrigerator, it just flies at us and we have no control of what it is. And we're saying, gee, couldn't they put some good, couldn't those powers that be put some healthier stuff in this refrigerator, please, maybe, and maybe they'll get it a little healthier. But hey, why don't we close the refrigerator and decide proactively that we are going to let into our homes the stuff that's healthy for us and and keep out the stuff that's bad for us and it's not going to involve an algorithm um and so you know i also hearkening to something grace was saying about the meeting that i think we both were in yesterday and and the the challenges it was a um uh collaborative technology alliance uh meeting um and uh, I, I assume that's what you're referring to, Grace, right? Um, the the CTA meeting that you were, uh, yeah, I'm not. Um, so you know that there's a lot of emphasis on a bunch, you know, a bunch of people who are working on different things. Me with Factor, you know, Vincent, uh, other people in this group and not in this group, 
and how can we interoperate? Um, and I think, you know, I, I felt I felt seen in a bad way um, by what Grace was saying about. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not, not Grace. I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean you were singling me out at all. But I thought, huh, there's an interesting, there's something interesting there about like the the kind of everybody sitting around saying, how can we do this thing together that ends up blocking any of us from advancing further on our own and is, is a little bit of a trap for, for tinkers, high-minded tinkers. Um, and I, I, do, I do feel stuck as somebody who built something that you know, was its own thing and realized that it has to be part of an ecosystem to really be effective unless, and Grace, Grace and I both heard somebody who in the meeting that we were in said, we need a fucking hit. You know, we need something that like whips everybody around to say, oh, forget about Facebook, it's blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, that something else is, you know, I mean, it was Instagram, and they bought that, and it was TikTok, and it was Snapchat, and it was all these other things that are, are, are sort of out Facebooking Facebook, not out ethicaling, privatizing, you know, and so the market hit that we want is a market that doesn't really know it exists and i'm i'm stumped and grace i want to talk to you more about this i'll, I'll show up for some office hours um and you know trying to 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 well i was about to say figure out which i think is is a sort of code for not doing um and um, but, but being humble enough not to say my way is the best way and I'm going to go for a hit at the expen expense of everybody else is I think what's needed, um, to get big. And, um, I, you know, want to, want to figure out <laughs> how we can collaborate and I'm making fun of myself as I say that. So I'll lower my hand. Uh, thanks, Michael. And uh, so it occurs to me that one of the things, one of the movements that's out there that's trying to feed us the broccoli is the indie web or the D-web or other kinds of things that there are many humans out there trying to get us, wean us off the addictive platforms and say, hey, here's an alternative platform that is decentralized where you own your own data, where we build our relationships. And uh, the problem is we can't get the hit from the new platforms because they're not as smooth and glossy and full of, you know, and bait. Addictive. And addictive. And full of bait yeah. and, and, and attractive stuff as, as the ones we're, we're sort of beefing about here. Um, but, but maybe Doug Carmichael, maybe one of the things we do is promote uh, indie web uh, kinds of technologies or and there's a variety of other movements to try to, to build sort of uh, independent, uh, more reliable platforms. Like let's just go there and let's, let's uh, move on to them. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, anyone else with a thought on, on this? I just want to interject one thing more, which is, you know, if you think about um, all the indie web things, the, the, the challenge, I'm going to go back to the food analogy. The challenge is that when you had, when you had like crappy food, crappy fast food, you know, addicting people and people started thinking, oh, maybe we should eat healthier. And you had, health food markets selling bruised, ugly looking produce for, you know, five times what, what um, mass grown produce cost in a supermarket. The market shift that happened 
from people interacting with those um, those health food markets and giving way to you know whole foods and chains and then ultimately to organic foods being in the produce aisles in the major supermarkets was not from um, was not from one hit. It was from the fact that to be to go to one health food store didn't didn't um, have a protocol prohibition on patronizing other health food stores. So you could, you know, build up health food stores and build up people who made organic stuff and, and use the marketplace to do this. And the problem in the indie web and alternative social network world is we're building all these protocols that don't speak to each other so that you, you pick one and then you can't pick the others and the market, the venture market in, in technology is making it so everybody's going for the separate hit as opposed to figuring out a way to interoperate successfully the way health food markets couldn't help but doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, that. For sure. Um, also, then there's issues behind the issues behind the issues. And once you start sort of unpacking things, one of my favorite horror stories is the fact that Nixon, when he was president, told Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, to go make food cheap. And part of the reason why we have really cheap carbs and why high fructose corn syrup is in everything and why this whole thing has eaten our, our food chain and why Klaus Mager has a lot of work to do to try to wean us out of the system into something that's more local, resilient, sustainable, and healthy is that large scale uh, sort of movement and energy and money was put behind the opposite behind the exact opposite. And so by analogy, and this is probably a weak analogy, over in the world of platforms and, and advertising and all that kind of stuff, my journey for the last 35 years started with the word consumer. I hate the fact that we're treated as mere consumers by these platforms. I think it's part of the problem that the ad model is their model. It would be kind of cool if they charged admission. So if we paid $5 a month for a good platform and then weren't advertised to and weren't dumpster dived, and were treated as citizens and you know instead wouldn't that be kind of cool probably wouldn't have 3.2 billion uh or however many active monthly users facebook has right now even as it leaks you know as it as it starts to lose uh, lose momentum but but there but there's systemic uh level problems that are that are uh deeply troubling that we could maybe pry under in some ways as well because there's a lot of interesting policy stuff happening right now uh some of which is deeply frightening uh, Mr. Homer. A couple things. One, um, Van Jones, many, many years ago, before he was really famous, said, if green becomes white, we're all screwed. Meaning that if only rich white people can afford to buy organic foods, then the organic food movement has completely failed. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to say was, you know, all these algorithms, millions of dollars and millions of person hours were, were spent on developing them and they are there to make money they are not there to lift up humanity they are not there to solve the problems or they're to make money for people not a very small group of people so i think that's kind of uh grace said something earlier and we did just start from the ground up if we're starting from the perspective of how do we make money we're going to get a really different product than if we're starting from the perspective of how do we solve a social problem here. So, um, and if you don't have the ability to raise money, it's really hard to build something that has large scale social impact. So it's a it's a double bind. Anybody got any ideas on how to get out of that? The Chinese finger trap. Yeah. Eliminate capitalism. There is that. Oh, easy. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I think we're seeing some weird hopeful stuff that is happening in the DAO space and in the crypto space. Like I'm not, I'm not ultra hopeful for it, but here's a group of people who have started to print money out of thin air. And then they started to like buy back carbon credits. And now they're trying to make a bid on the, on the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo's uh, um, uh, rainforest. So it's interesting because it's a movement with some money behind it, even though it's kind of BS money because we don't have like 
one grain of corn or wheat. Like, so it's a little bit of a problem because we don't really support ourselves physically. But there's something really happening in that movement that has money behind it. That, like I said, the money is invented out of thin air, but there's also this kind of like young people realizing they don't have a chance in the existing system and being like, I'm getting some Dogecoin. You're getting good Dogecoin. All right, let's get some Prima DAO. Let's get some, you know, rede it's called Redeem. It's the Redeem DAO. And it's like, oh my Lord have mercy. But there's something happening. So I do have that. So that's the answer to Ken's question. I do have ideas. Like I'm, I'm like skeptical, but supportive. I don't know. Like they bought a lot of carbon credits. So it's, I, I tend to be skeptical too, Gil. Like, is it really happening? But. Uh, um, it's, sorry, uh, let's go Kevin then Gil. Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of uh, funding things that need to be funded, you know, we're our marketplace for uh, growth capital for earned income nonprofits is moving forward. Uh, and nonprofits create earned income because program grants from foundations are oppressive. <clears throat> and they, you know, uh, they give you money for the soup, but not the soup bowls. And that's just, and they think they're being prudent. Uh, and so nonprofits have created earned income, things they sell, right? Earned income, they don't call it making money, uh, which, but anyway, uh, and, but nobody gives them growth capital once they figure something out. So we're about to launch a thing with uh, actually some, uh, uh, some nonprofit or fiscally sponsored uh, farms here uh, that, um, to, to solve some of that. And uh, so anyway, I, I think it, it, it has some real potential. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Stuart, and then back to the queue. Okay, I thought Gil wanted to say something. But oh, I, yeah, I apologize. You're completely right. I'll, I just missed that. I'll, I'll pass. Mine is, mine is real quick. All right. I just wanted to comment on, um, on Kevin's use in the word nonprofit. That's where the problem lies, that we think of these as, <laughs> thank you, Grace, that we think of these things as nonprofit. It's how we're measuring profit and loss. And that's the, that's the thinking that, that has everything all fucked up. Mm -hmm. um, I read over the last couple of days, a couple of really brilliant articles. One was called The Theft of the Commons, which I will post in the chat and a link to my brain where I, how I annotated it, because it was just full of wisdom. And one of the problems is that we've not only lost a lot of the beliefs, practices, and sort of customs of way back before when we had commons and lived together on the commons, we can't imagine those things ever having been viable or never mind being viable again. We can't even imagine our way into something different from capitalism and the normal, everybody's got to have money, companies need to make a profit, and that's the way the whole world works. And Grace and others are busy trying to figure out What's the story we tell? What's the platform we create? What's the way we wean ourselves from that sort of belief system? And it is like crazy, crazy challenging mission. That is that is just a, a, a not so wacko mission because it's we're so deep into the into the model. So let's go, uh, Barry, Grace, Rick. Yeah, you know, I don't have a prepared monologue for this morning. We nobody prepares for these things, so don't worry, Barry. This is just a check-in for what kind of things are happening in our lives that are kind of yeah. OGM-ish, like squishy. You know, a, a lot of these issues are not really new. They, you know, we've been going around the tree. You know, like Pooh going around the tree over and over. You see his own footprints, and he thinks he's on the right track. The first time I come across an issue, and I have to pause and think about it. If I successfully think about it, I'll write out my thoughts and post them you know, on my blog or someplace where I could find them later because rethinking them from scratch is usually not very efficient. And sure enough, the, the same issues come around you know, after a certain latency to come around again. And I go, oh, yeah, I remember thinking about that once upon a time. And I go pull up my thoughts about it and I share them. And nothing much happens. And then you know, sometime later, the same issue comes around again. And I have this feeling like we're stuck in a loop and we're not, we're not even, not even making use 
of the good ideas that have come out, been presented, and then sort of dissipated in, into the wind. And it's, it's like good ideas die on the vine because they're being suffocated by a plethora of bad ideas. Thanks, Barry. And there's certainly a, a surfeit of bad ideas out there. Uh, and arguably, our world is being designed and run based on most of the bad ideas, based on a whole bunch of bad ideas. Um, and idea combat is what makes the world turn, I'm afraid. M my little amateur version of history is that there's a struggle in the cockpit over the joystick between at, at different times two sometimes three parties over like where so their society is going to go one of them wins for a while feels like they lost and could lose at any moment so they become paranoid and bad things happen but then you know then we travel then that vessel travels in that direction for a while until there's another struggle in the cockpit and and mostly in the meantime the humans the citizens get squished or crushed or run over um so let's go uh grace rick stacy this is a check-in, eh? Yeah, it is. It's a check-in. I haven't been on a check-in call for quite a while because I've been busy doing, I had a workshop that was overlapping this call for six weeks and I was, I can't remember, I had so many, I went to so many events and gatherings that my head is spinning and I'm signed up for some more and my head will continue to spin for a while. And what's been coming out of this is, um, I think I mentioned it last week, is this, it's not necessarily a re religion, it is gonna be a religion, but is this new DAO, which we're calling Priceless DAO. And we're gonna be launching on September 22nd, simultaneously in Kenya and London at some uh, Ethereum events that are going on during those weeks. And we've been looking at contribution-based DAOs and the amounts of money that they've been raising has been 40, 50, million dollars and that sounds fine for us we could we could manage with those types of budgets and it's me and a couple other princess priceless priceless about io it's not official we're not launching yet we're still working on the technical back end we've been working on the technical back end which is it's all these actually they're actually apps that are supposed to be pretty easy to use and we've been doing it for about 10 days. The technical mess of blockchain is like, it's so unusable, it's so unusable. And not to mention that there are all these transaction fees. So my two co-founders, one is a Filipino woman and the other is a Kenyan woman. So I have to send them money so that they would be able to even register their name and pay the transaction fees and what completely inaccessible to the developing world, completely. And, and Shai's gonna be speaking at, at, at Eat Safari about that. Like, here are these things. And it's like, if you haven't got a few hundred dollars just to set up your account, not even go beyond setting up your account, you're not in and it's pretty crazy. Um, and we're doing some, yeah, shh, still slightly secret. Um, and we've been um, basing it on Balaji's uh, book that came out and Vitalik has been commenting on it, which was called The Network Space. So the idea that um, you could create these online networks of people and then um, buy locations, you know, purchase locations and then become like have this kind of like floating nation state with location. I think that this is a naive approach. Yeah, how to start a new country. Exactly. I think it's a little naive. We're going to be starting land based. I've been, I mean, I've been focused on food and water and how do we become sustainable? I think one of the big issues that the crypto um, industry has been naive about is that we have no actual resources. We're just a complete drain on the electrical grid, on the cloud servers. We don't have independence from those. We're not independent. Most of that stuff is hosted on Amazon or Google and, you know, like, it's actually completely dependent on the existing economy and we can't pay our rent in crypto. And even if we can, it's, it's just this delusion. And so what we're really out to do is to convert some of this funny invented money out of thin air back into soil, back into culture, back into human beings and really look at ways that we can create land-based communities that are 
starting to become sustainable. There's a lot of really interesting work. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of interesting work that's being done by different people who are looking at this problem. For example, I found somebody who's looking at how do we deal, you know, how do we reuse chips? Because those are just getting thrown out and we're going to run out of silicon. And all this stuff that I think there's tremendous potential in create like returning to the soil, returning to community, returning to living together, returning to um, community to community, sustainable regions. And so that's the kinds of experiments that we're going to be doing that you can look on the website that Jerry's leaked. <laughs> but we're um, under we're some, under DA. You're under DA. That's worth the paper it's signed on, most of which is digital. And so, yeah, we have some really great ideas. I mean, one of the ideas that, that Shai and I came up with was what if around a national park in Kenya, you would have self-sustainable communities. So it would functionally kind of expand the land of the national park and really prevent poachers because you've got these communities that are self-sustainable around it. So a ring of those types of communities. Um, we're working with Diana Finch in um, uh, with the Brixton uh, sorry, Bristol Town, Bristol Pay, looking at how do we create community-based recognition rewards that aren't monetarily based. So we've got a bunch of really cool stuff that we're really interested in doing and uh, trendy, eh? And um, that's what I've been up to. It's been pulling a tremendous amount of my attention and it's been, um, it's one of those things like you really feel like it's in flow. You know, the, these two conferences that we're going to be speaking at, she was asked, and then I just found one, and I said, can I speak? And they said, yes, you can speak. And people have been reacting really positively, and um, it just has that sense of going in the right direction. So you're, really you're, you've got things in motion. It's lovely, Grace. Thank you. Yeah. Um, love that a lot. Uh, let's go Rick, Stacy, Eric. Hi, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> I just want to pick up on a theme from our, the last conversation we had uh, and, and dovetail into something that you've been talking about and where my interests lie. Um, you know, I, I, as I said last time, I'm, I'm sort of a, <clears throat> a lurker on the, uh, on the fringes of this, of this group and uh, enjoyed the last session. And uh, I, I was left thinking about, well, how can this group and its email correspondence, which I find a little overwhelming because I'm not reading it, you know, as a as a regular, uh, in the sense of taking it all in. But it's it's difficult to process when you're trying to pop in and out, and I think that creates a barrier uh, for people to learn more about what this group is doing. And I can't say I fully understand it yet either. But that doesn't matter. I'm sufficiently intrigued uh, to to come to the meeting. Um, but it it actually uh, goes back to something you were talking right at the very beginning which is, you know, what, you know, if we, I think we do need a complete redesign if we're going to do things right, if we're going to do things that, uh, you know, can, can work um, more profoundly on the challenges ahead that involve slow thinking, yada, yada, uh, and deliberate design, uh, you know, how can we uh, create a platform for that? And of course, there isn't a perfect platform out there. And obviously, it'd be nice to have a DAO with a crypto or as it was in the commons. Every everybody participated. They had ownership in it. They got uh, community rewards for their contributions, uh, and it was a um, a, a not for profit but for purpose organization. Um, you know, to me, that's that's where we need to go. But given the fact we don't have anything close to that, as far as I'm aware, what's the nearest thing to it? Um, and I'd be curious about people's reaction to that. There's one thing that I, I, I decided to take a course on, and I don't know whether this is going to pan out to be something uh, more substantive, but um, Margaret uh, Atwood's holding a course in September, and she's um, uh, developing a, a sort of like a crypto for it, and it's a, a group of other people who are working with her. And they're using a program called uh, Disco, um, and it's, mighty, it's like Mighty Networks, but it's trying to differentiate itself and being an upstart to my networks. And they're trying to integrate Slack into it so that there's much more effective asynchronous communication. So my question to you, to, to you, Jerry, and others, 
where is the cutting edge uh, of this um, brave new world platform where we can really, um, I would say, I'm still in favor of the word of alignment. Uh, we can do lots of different things, but if at least we're on the line in the same direction, we have a, a vision of where we want to go to. It means we can operate at a multiplicity of levels and in our little ecosystems, collaborating with others and whatever. So um, where, where, where is the future? Uh, where, where's the best hope of having the <coughs> ideal platform for doing this sort of lifelong learning? Um, Rick, thanks for asking. And is that the right disco, the one that I put in the in the chat? I think yeah, it might be. I think it might uh, be disco.co dot, disco dot op. Yeah, let me just check. Let me just check. Okay. Uh, and um, let me um, just share screen for a sec because uh, I've put disco here under a bunch of different things, including potential OGM architecture components, which is a big long list of lots of interesting things out there that are mostly open source that would help us. Um, we, so one of the things that Pete and I were working on, and then we stalled out a little bit, is we wanted to convene us to sit down and think about what are the, uh, what are the different platforms for accounting for value flows, which is something that this organization needs, that the meta project needs, that, you know, all different orgs that in our, in our circles need. And so here's uh, disco.coop, there's one called Coordinate, there's Comakery. Uh, Open Collective, which is a group that uh, is actually really close to OGM because it's part of the Lionsburg Umbrella uh, organization is one of them. Uh, and then there's another one called Sensorica. And this is just my radar scan. So I'm sure there's another half dozen that are out there building this stuff, right? Um, and, and your question for me, Rick, fits into two uh, really big important questions that, that kind of bubble up into this one. What are our next two stacks? And I'm borrowing here stacks from uh, the idea of solution stacks like the Linux, Linux Apache, MySQL, and PGP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that there's uh, an organizational stack and a societal stack that kind of lie above each other. And right now, the organizational stack is, well, you get to be either a, a, a C Corp or a 501c3 or some weird little odd hybrid, because those things we know how to deal with, everything else is really kind of weird. Uh, I was part of a, a group with Christina Bowen and others uh, who tried to create a multi-stakeholder cooperative like five years ago, four years ago, and we couldn't, there wasn't a place to do it. So, so we wound up picking some other organizational uh, structure. So, so how does that kind of work? And then the present societal stack is capitalism, and uh, democracy, which we think is liberal democracy and we think it works, but actually it's turning into illiberal democracy everywhere and it's under threat. <laughs> um, and there's a whole bunch of assumptions or, uh, and mechanisms in place, like welded in place around uh, money and value and lending and you know all, all the dependent interdependencies uh, globally. And, and I would argue that both of these stacks are under active renegotiation right this minute and that Web3 and crypto and NFTs and all that is an attempt to shift currency into some other sort of thing. And I'm not entirely sure it's the right thing because it's still monetary. It's just decentralized and look how hackable it is, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so I think these are like genuinely important uh, questions uh, to, to, to care about together. And we're trying to figure out how to organize ourselves to be not systematic or methodical, but maybe just a wee bit more organized about it. Yeah. Uh, and one of my pet peeves about conversations like ours is we post a whole bunch of articles on our, on our Google group mailing list instead of building a shared memory out someplace where it's actually persistent yeah. and, and annotatable. Exactly. And I'm trying to cross that bridge, which is like really clunky to cross. I mean, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get some volunteers to help me annotate a, uh, an event I'm helping produce. This is in part my check-in for this call, I'm helping produce an event in New York with Betaworks called uh, Render about tools for thinking. And I'd love some people who like to map and annotate to come help do that. Um, Michael, it's in your backyard. I'm hoping you'll be able to attend. Uh, looking forward to so, like seeing you in person and shaking your mitt. That's gonna be really fun. Uh, Stacey, it's close to you. Um, and so, uh, how, I think that's one of the things that we as, a, as, an, as an organization can help uh, with somehow, mm -hmm. uh, but there's lots of different angles to this, uh, and it's sort of it's bigger than our 
than our time and attention will mm -hmm. permit right. in different ways. So that's my big answer to your nice question. And Grace has also a, an answer. So Grace, off to you. Yeah, to me, this is really like what was interesting about Rick's question is I was saying that I'm doing this thing that he and his question was, where's this thing? And it was directly after I had said, that's the thing I'm building. And so there's something either not clear about my messaging or something that we've been alluding to here, which is like, how do we help each other become this thing? Like maybe I'm not convincing enough or my message isn't convincing enough or something that I said didn't strike Rick as like, because he asked the question right after I said like, I'm building this big, huge thing, right? That is addressing the stack. And then we keep asking this question, like how do we help the people doing stuff here? And then I'm like, it feels like, so I don't have the exact question, but the question is like, how does what I said either not fall into what OGM is about or yes, fall into it, or what would a collaboration around that look like? And it, it's true that I'm being slightly exclusive uh, based on gender. So, you know, there's definitely something there, but I'm, you know, that might not be a hard and fast rule. That might be something we could work on. You know, it's like, there's something yeah, there's something there for me that feels like it falls into all of the things we've been asking about, like how do we help each other, and then what is the big thing, and then what is the stack? And Grace, I just connected Priceless DAO into the distributed accounting of value flows and the rest of those sort of solution communities. Ah! Is that a terrible thing, or like like that? That's... It's just my problem is the euphemism value. Yes, like, what I agree. The hell do I, but other than that, yes, I belong there. But the question about what is value and what is wealth and how do we uh, how do we appreciate those, those are central to this quest. Those Absolutely. are deep, deeply important questions. So I want to put those on the table and see yeah. how do how do we communicate that out? Because like stories, what wins? Like uh, stories are just really huge. Uh, Mr. Breitbart. Can, can I, I just quickly respond to just Grace? Say, like, I agree with Kevin too, because I've also thought that too. Like, why am like why aren't we working more with Kevin? And like, you know, he's got a clear project. Yeah, I agree with that too. Exactly. And Doug, before you go, back to Rick for a sec. Yeah, just to quickly respond to you, Grace. Let me let me share um, a perspective that might help you with your reaction, and that is, um, I I'm coming in with a naive perspective. I'm not, you know, inside of the group, and sometimes outsiders can shed light on insiders' blind spots. And so what, I, what I'm saying is what I don't have an appreciation of is the exact nature of your work and how does it fit into the emerging ecosystems of what's evolving. So I don't have the big picture or the particular picture to understand um, you know, what your sort of unique contribution and, and direction is. So I'm quite happy to, to give you a naive perspective that might, or chat offline sometime just to, to chat about that and how to make it accessible to outsiders. Thank you. Um, let's go to Doug B. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge Dave Witzel, who also has a community uh, that's sort of a neighbor of ours, et cetera, to like, take a swing at the question Rick just asked. Um, so Doug. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to touch on this value con construct. Um, a partner of mine and I um, landed with creating what we call the Values Foundation, but we started with a statement called the Values Manifesto. And, and it was on the premise that um, value currently constrained to mapping to fiat currency, like that's the primary association driver. And there is a non-economic orientation that says we're all in this same bucket and we're all um, part of and connected to a, a very complex system of flows. And there are contributions of the, the living things within that ecosystem to the system at large. And there are lots of facets and dimensions, forms um, that value can take 
in manifestation, both tangible and intangible, that have nothing to do with fiat currency. Fiat currency is but one of and, and possibilities of types of contribution to the system. And, you know, um, I was playing with Dave Smith in, in New Zealand around reforestation and a vision for a, an ecosystemic value, value ecosystem uh, orientation to that. And the idea was that, that money contributed as, as a value funding and underwriting other moving parts of the vision did not map to ownership. It didn't translate into buying anything. It was simply a particular type of value that helped fuel and serve and facilitate and contribute to the greater grander. But there were the, you know, indigenous tribes um, and local populations who whose economies could be based in supporting reforestation in areas. And there was the largest reforestation not-for-profit in the world um, to, who understood the expert, had the expertise and the mechanics around doing that. And there were the data dimensions of real-time sensing of the state and health of the forest and on and on and on and on and on. So it's all, it, so the value construct is about, am I contributing? Second of all, Am I contributing a value at the expense of another value, which is extra the extractive thing? Or am I contributing in a value add place, not explicitly at the expense of another value? And um, so there is a whole contextual way of relating to the word. And I, I just wanted to toss that in because um, it's actually uh, orientationally um, a way of, of dimensionally expanding significantly how any of these initiatives are related to in terms of how many dimensions and facets are there. And the individual attribution accreditation of a contribution to that system is a recognition acknowledgement in the incentivization frame um, that doesn't necessarily derive from um, ownership or old paradigm economic frame. So I uh, just wanted to throw that into the mix. Thanks, Doug. Um, Mr. Witzel, do you care to take a swing at, the, at Rick's question earlier? Well, how would you frame Rick's question, Jerry? Sorry to... Well, um, it's... Um... A piece of what are these communities up to? How do they look from the outside? Um, what are our shared missions or goals or any of those kinds of pieces? And I'm probably forgetting half the question here. Great, yeah. And it's been and Rick's been participating in some of the GRC things, so it's been it's been great to see him kind of crossing crossing the threads a little bit. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I I definitely have a piece of. So I come from kind of. The framework I've been using around this stuff is kind of the internet and kind of open source, right? And so that to me is like the, the scaffolding I'm using to learn from or something. And so one of the things from the conversation is I kind of need the words, you know, I, I kind of need to use value and I need to use stack and I need to use network, right? Um, and then I guess I have to explore what they mean. I, and I use regeneration, right? And that word's got all kinds of problems with it, right? Uh, and then it's like, I don't even want to get into the arguments about what is a community that we used to have a long time ago, you know? <laughs> it's like, um, so anyway, I, I feel like we, you know, in some sense, we, if we didn't have these words, I don't know what we, what we would, how we could talk, right? So I feel like and we could learn from them, but I kind of need the words. Um, and one of the things that I've been trying to do with the organizations we've been doing is kind of quote, build the network. And to me, the key around the network is the flow, right? It's not the connection, it's the flow. And value is what flows. And so, yeah, I think poop is value, right? I mean, if it's if it flows and if it's used, right? I mean, if it's- Getting it, a little it's, gross, but I like it. <laughs> I mean, if it just sits in you know a dairy barn and it stinks and rots and creates pollution, then less you know negative value or something, I don't know. Um, so, so the, then the issue is flow. And I think what we've tended to do with the market is see the only thing that we care about flowing is money. 
and in and what we need is more things flowing kind of productively but we don't know how to incent that kind of this has been my assumption and i've been having mm -hmm. some conversations recently we're trying to get funding for the regeneration pollination networking events right it's like I mean, kind of a tiny amount of money we'd like you know i don't know fifty thousand a year or something like that to host you know dozens and dozens of networking events and they're just networking right they just connect people um and i'll and, and you kind of end up looking in the kind of in the regeneration space for supporters but nobody in the regeneration space has much money and then part of the some of the groups in the greater generation space are really still market-based right so they you know it's like let's not talk about money so, well, how am I supposed to survive? You know, the person who's running these things, how is she supposed to survive? So I don't know. I feel like we're, we're def definitely trapped in, in some of these issues. But, but if we could create more flow, and some of it doesn't have cost very much. I mean, it doesn't have the expensive flow, but, you know, there's still, I think, some kind of a financial cost that's involved, at least in our current, our current framework. Mm -hmm. Can I just throw in one more story? Because I've been thinking about it here. Sure. And, and it's about, it's around the commons, and it's been like, me kind of grokking the commons a little bit more. I'm sitting up at a lake in Vermont where there's a family owned cabin. And there's like now 13 cousins who own this little beat up cabin on a lake. And like the negotiations about maintaining the cabin and the history of the cabin and stuff. I don't know if you guys have family owned properties, but they're, they're really f f uh, fascinating. And there's been a discussion about the lakeside beach. There's a lovely little, you know, 200 feet of sand that, that faces the water and who gets to use the beach. And whether you should have to pay for it. And, it and it's like pretty clearly to me that beaches are abundant right it, you can always put another person on the beach kind of you know but 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 you want you want scarcity to kind of pay for the cabin so this the the, the market relies on scarcity and if you don't have if you have an abundant thing you have to create scarcity out of it and so the commons the getting rid of commons is create scarcity and so the issue to me is scarcity as much as anything. It's like, if you want to look for situations where you're artificially creating scarcity and question whether there's another way to do that. So right. anyway, that was I my like, insight for the week. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. And I like your last sentence in particular question if there's other ways to do it, because sometimes, sometimes scarcity is easily worked around. Uh, in Management 101 at Wharton, we had a case called the Ugly Orange case, which I'm going to totally give away to everybody. So major plot spoiler, cover your ears if you don't want to hear it. But class is divided in two. Everybody gets a case. Uh, your group needs to, there's a shipment of oranges coming in, ugly oranges, which are the last of their kind. And you need to buy this shipment because you have a way to cure cancer with the juice of this orange. <clears throat> and um, you have a million dollar budget would go. And the, the other group has their own, their, their, their case and you have to negotiate with them. The answer is, you need the juice of the orange. They need the peel of the orange. For a buck, you can buy the shipment. Then you can spend your $999,999 on research. But it isn't until you discover that you that you don't need the same parts of the orange that you figure that out. And it like really stuck on, stuck with me. It's like very, very often these solutions are, are, are small and, and different. And one of the things from this theft of the commons article is that there used to be different kinds of estovers and easements into the forest, for example. And you could gather, you could gather lumber for fire, but not for something else. You could, widows could forage their pigs in the forest, uh, but nobody else. There, there were all these sweet little things that allowed for multiple uses of the same sort of territory in different ways that had been figured out over time. Um, song lines are a little bit like that in Australia, and I apologize for the amateur anthropology, but song lines aren't just stories of origin stories, but they're also maps, and they're also easements and rights negotiations, and they're also like a blockchain. They're also kind of a transaction history of what happened. They're, they're like the Ur blockchain. And so different cultures around the world have different ways of negotiating small and subtle uses of assets in ways that are durable. It's really interesting. Uh, in a perfect order, uh, uh, an anthropologist writes about Bali, how the, far, how the thousand year old Hindu rituals on the island of Bali in the, in the water temples contained an algorithm about who should get how much water off the mountain, whose field should be flooded, whose field should lie fallow, which was actually better than technologists who came in and tried to use golden rice and fertilizers and uh, et cetera, and almost not only destroyed farming on Bali, but almost wiped out the, the reefs offshore because uh, all this fertilizer crap came off the mountain and started like creating algal blooms and God knows what. So it's like, 
that there is abundance where we think there's scarcity. And I fear very much when I hear the sentence, we must create artificial scarcity because more often than not, there's interesting workarounds to that somehow. And so much of that is because money is a real simplifier. It's like, okay, we'll just put a price on everything. And then everybody just has to get a dollar and with a buck, you can buy anything. And it's it's not just a great simplifier that that just tears right through society. Jerry, uh, I would through, you, just just to, I, I don't think that pe many people would say, oh, we need to create artificial scarcity. Oh, many do though. That's the well, it's kind of the understated. I mean, I think I, I feel like you need to rec we need to recognize when artificial scarcity is being created. But yes. but it isn't really that that that's what you know. People are saying we need a market, you know, or or you know, we or the market should decide those things like that. That's where the, the scarcity is implied. Yes, and but and also like the libertarian worldview is if only there were perfect markets for everything, the world would work perfectly. And if we had you know property rights protected, and I'm like, wow, those are exactly the damaging things that that run against everything I just said. How do we live with libertarians who have some good instincts, like hey, government's too big, and figure this thing out together? And that that's really hard. And the the involuntary renegotiation of the social contract that we're in is heading towards some new stacks that a hundred years from now, we're going to take for granted. We will either not survive, in which case we won't need a stack, or we will have found our way to some new stacks, which may be completely dysfunctional. And I'm hoping that they're completely functional because of the efforts that we're talking about here. Because Grace's DAO is gonna suddenly thrive and help a lot of people find their way out of the current mess because these other organiz organizations and entities will make that work. So I'm hoping that's what happens. Anyway, sorry for the long screed. Uh, Doug, can you put your hand down unless you wanted to jump back in? And I'll go to Stacy, Eric, Julian. And we're getting, we're 15 minutes away from the end of our call time. So we won't make it through the whole queue. Here's what the whole queue looks like in my, in my chat. Well, I'm going to skip my check-in other than I just want to make an observation and connect something that Barry said before he left about good ideas being covered over by bad ideas and tied to something that Grace and an observation that I made from when I first came here is I heard Kevin Jones talking about something he really wanted to have done. And I noticed a lot of like pushback and almost like for me, at least whether this was what other people's perception was or not, I felt like he was being told it was a naive approach or couldn't work. And then I watched him go off and do it. And I personally learned a lot from that. So I just wanted to share that. And I'm complete. And I'm looking forward to the uh, Think Camp, as you know. Yay, cool. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Eric, Julian, Judy. You're muted, unfortunately. Uh, Eric Rangel, I think you're on a different call. So let's go, uh, let's skip him for a sec. Uh, and go uh, Julian, Judy, then Eric. All right, so for uh, check-in, I'm madly preparing for the SIGGRAPH conference, which starts Monday. Uh, the effort I've been putting on most recently is the history of computer graphics. And this is a knowledge base I'm defining, which is a reference source about the history of computer graphics, as it says, but it's also a research framework so that uh, in, as part of my overall initiative, it's uh, intended to provide a base for research into how to manage knowledge. So overall, I'm trying to redefine how humans interact with technology, and the history is one of the test cases that I'm using for that. So I've uh, pretty much got the abstract and proposal finished, and I'm going to be having discussions with other with colleagues next week um, as my main point in um, trying to develop the big effort, which I call Project Venturi. So, um, I also recently got a Tilt 5 system, so I'm starting to build that into my overall framework of how, uh, again, how people interact. And uh, let's see, with my kids gone, I'm now converting the bedroom to a uh, extended reality laboratory. So. That's funny. Can you describe Tilt 5 for people who don't know what it is? Uh, tilt 5, let's see. So if you imagine there's a, a special material on the table, so it looks like a game board, except it's actually blank because whatever game or whatever you're doing is virtual. You put on the glasses, which are very lightweight, and the augmented reality image appears in the glasses. Uh, of course, as you move around, you walk around, move your head, then the view changes according to you looking into this virtual world. 
the critical part of it is what they call the wand. And it's a game controller, except it has a, a well, an extension, an antenna pointing out, so that you don't do game controller kinds of interactions, which is bullshit. That's a throwback to the 70s. The wand is it's a your hand. You are, you move your hand around like this. And devices like this have been around for easily 30 years, but they're generally really expensive. The best one is the sensible technologies, and that's still 10 grand just for the device. You still need all the computers and stuff. But it's it's a really nice system. The, the Tilt 5 system, I think, is 259. So this is actually affordable. And it gets back to your cognitive abilities. Of, I, mean, I mean, pretty much everybody here weighs their hands when they talk, right? And that's how you should be interacting with your system. And you, you point at things. And the Tilt 5, it doesn't exactly let you point at things like that. But it will once I can talk them into changing some of the uh, hardware technology behind the wand. So. Uh, their focus is on what they call virtual tabletop games. And the CEO is pretty clear that they're building the technology for a gaming company for games, but she's also really open to other uses. So I've seen different kinds of business cases being built on top of the Tilt 5. And then she knows quite well that my interest is in research and in human cognition. So uh, looking forward to a good interaction, having some results to show off in a month. So Awesome. Thanks, Julian. And Grace, thank you for finding the account. That's the, the link to the calendar, correct? <clears throat> awesome. Um, Eric, while you were busy engaged in a different conversation, I went to you. No big deal. Uh, if you'd like to go now, now is your time. I'll just quickly say hello, everybody. Um, so I was on vacation for two weeks, and now I'm back at work. And that shock of uh, returning, because <laughs> always something that hits me. And uh, yeah, it brings up questions. Well, why do we work? <laughs> and and uh, what, uh, yeah, what's that difference between the mindset <laughs> with uh, work and vacation? And uh, is there a better way? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, basically, this is the system I was born into, and I do it. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, I'm uh, getting back what well, was nice, like I had a call with Mark Carranza and Jonathan Sand this week, and he showed me his Fox Pro system, and it, I'm, I'm understanding it more, the guts behind it and the magic behind it. So maybe something will come out of that, but I'm just playing it by ear. Thanks. Mm, thanks, Eric. Um, Judy, are you still in the There you are. Good. Yeah, my system froze for some reason. Um, but I guess in terms of what I've been up to, I'm sort of trying to do the same kind of things we're talking about here in terms of recognition of courses of action toward bigger sustainable goals for multiple different organizations and finding that it's quite interesting to get groups that have not really thought beyond the immediate to think about the bigger picture of what it is that they're contributing to the organization of the world and how they might go about doing that differently because they're very much down in the grass and weeds of the day-to-day -day tasks and initiatives. And so that's helping me refine with a number of different groups, big and small, how we introduce the topics of um, foresight, longer range thinking, analysis of threats and things like that. It seems as though people see the big trends in the world, but they don't actually think about how that impacts what they're doing today or could impact them in six months because this, this, or this is changing in the local or national community. So that's kind of where my interests and energies lie right now. Thanks, Judy. Um, Ken, Michael, Dave. Hello, everybody. Um, I am coping with uh, another round of plantar fasciitis. And uh, so oh, my wow. world has gotten really small. Um, it's it's after two years of of lockdown and uh i'm just like i really am antsy i'm going a little stir crazy because i can't go out and walk um i can basically make it to the store and the farmer's market and that's about the extent of my ability to be on my feet so um i will say that i i got these really jazzy um hoka slides that when i'm wearing them around the house prevent me from uh feeling like I'm in pain, but as soon as I take them off, it's really painful. So my world's very small at the moment, uh, it consists of being on Zoom calls, reading and being in my patio. <laughs> so there's not a lot going on there. Uh, I do want to thank Gil Friend for coming over for lunch the other day. We had a really uh, good time, uh, spent a couple hours together. Um, 
my work's a little slow at the moment. I have things coming up in the fall, so I'm just kind of enjoying being not uh, in productive mode, since that's a theme in this, uh, this call here. Um, I spent uh, an hour the other day just staring at the clouds. It was the most productive hour of my week. I highly recommend it. That's lovely. Thanks, Ken. I hope your I hope your feet's feeling better soon. Um, Thank you. Michael, Dave, Gill. Um, I got to speak a little bit earlier, so I'm going to skip uh, uh, weighing in further in this round. Um, and I look forward to hearing from others of you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Dave, do you want to jump back in? Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I got to rant already too. I, I guess the one thing that I am working on still, and, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago or months ago, I guess, is the trying to figure out if it helps to do, uh, if storytelling is important to creating a movement of an idea like regeneration, and there's a bunch of people telling these stories through podcasts and stuff, does it help to somehow aggregate them together and cross promote and advertise them as, a, as an entity? And is it, if anybody has experience with that kind of thing, or if anybody's doing podcasting and wants to talk about this kind of stuff, I'd be really curious. But it feels like we have a bunch of kind of sparsely listened to podcasts and other kinds of media, um, but we'd like that to be lots of people listening. And is there some way that we can kind of cooperate to, to make everybody more successful? So just to grow the common audience for a series of podcasts you're saying? Yeah, I'm kind of what I guess what I'm imagining is that we have we create a worker owned co op, a media creator owned co op of people who produce re content around the regeneration space. And that co op then helps market and create sponsorship money and maybe do back end efficiency kinds of things. I don't know, training or something like that that, that makes the storytelling better, makes it more popular, more widely distributed, things like that. Um, but I'd love to have models or experiences for that if anybody knows the thing. Yeah, um, this I not exactly a model, but April was just invited to become part of the Silicon Guild, which is limited to 50 authors uh, who consider themselves humanists. So it was started by Adam Grant and Dan Pink and a few others. I think Adam Grant is no longer in the group because you spend a couple sort of years in there and then you kind of wander out and then they bring other people in. It's a very interesting group that isn't about promoting one another's books. It's not that at all, but it is about creating a focal spot for attention on humanist approaches towards solving the world's problems. Uh, so it does that a bunch. There's also the Big Ideas Club. There's a bunch of other kind of book summary things. There's a, a bunch of other places that have made their, their sort of business to try to, to you know, summarize and, and put things in. So that's sort of there. And then, I'm, I'm trying to take a complementary but different approach to this entirely, which is how do we uh, weave these things into each other so that we can see the common threads across the conversations and podcasts and so forth and, and, and find the threads and call out the ideas and the wisdom and make them easier to use. So it's not about how do we get more podcasts out, but rather how do we note that, hey, Jim Rutt did this interview with Tyson Young Porta, which is just kick ass and it's full of all these insights, which you can then follow through to these other kinds of threads and, and follow back to what is the next uh, stack, what is the next social stack going to be for kind of thing. So I'm, I'm interested in not the multitude of conversations, but the relationships and linkages and, and nuggets in the conversations in some way. Don't know if that helps. That's really interesting. Well, and we've talked about things like uh, uh, clearly you need like a Siskel and Ebert or something like that. I mean, I've been kind of assuming it's a it's a broad it's a broad net, and you bring in lots of people, so you wouldn't be trying to I don't know cherry pick the top fifty or something like that. But right. maybe that's not a good idea. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm still troubled. I don't know what you guys think about this. Like, how important is the uh, power curve around human capacity? I mean, we spend so much of our energy trying to make the elite more elite, right? We have all these universities and fancy classes in school and, you know, sports programs or whatever, right? Is, does, is that really critical to society? What if, what if we just spent the money on the average? Would we be okay or, or would we collapse into some kind of Enrendian, you know, dystopia or something? So oh, again, God. I, that was, <laughs> I, so I've been kind of thinking I would take anybody who's producing content not yeah. only the top, you know, but agreed, you know. agreed. One of the one of the magic things that appeared when crowdsourcing got hot some decade ago was that this thorny problem of adhesive 
technology would be solved by a, a math teacher in Bolivia or something like that. It, would, it was people who were not qualified, not even often in the domain in question, who were finding elegant and creative solutions to stuff everywhere. And just, just opening the doors and making that possible had caused a lot of really, I think, great motion in the world. I don't know how... Yeah, was it true? Complete. I mean, it was a hypothet is it was in a hy hypothetical. I get it, but do we know? I mean, did it work? Is it those those things yeah. actually were happening. I mean, people were people were winning contests who were not qualified. Like like these are not these are not just sort of make believe stories. These were actually things that were started happening. Um, and it turns out that the highly paid person you put in charge of solving a problem is necessarily the person who's going to be able to solve the problem. They may in fact be too close to the problem to solve it. Uh, so there's a lot of that and. Um, and the problem, one of the conceptual problems with this approach is that it is combinatorially explosive and the, the volume you suddenly take for granted of possible applicants and interesting things to read and do explodes. And it's very hard for an individual to make their way through that mass of, of ideas and content. So how to, how, to, how, to, how to handle that as a community, again, I think comes back to a piece of what OGM uh, is is in some sense about. Yeah. Um, Gil, Kevin, Mike, if we have a few minutes left, but uh, yeah. Gil, sorry. I'll try to go quick. So uh, I think, I think Dave, the answer to your question is yes. Um, is there value in doing that sort of thing? Yes. And uh, Jerry's add on feels like a good thing to add on to it. Not necessary, but a good, you know, good sidebar enhancement. Um, which reminds me that the uh, the word stack got thrown around a lot in this conversation. I'm wary of stack coming from a complex adaptive systems or living systems point of view. I don't think we see stacks in the living world in the same way we talk about stacks in the tech world. So it's a, it may be a dangerous meme to grab onto too tightly. Um, uh, check in, check in. Um, uh, I'm doing more of my self-management on paper and not on computer these days. I've gone from the, uh, my, my computer tracking systems allow me to generate enormous lists of to-dos that are totally overwhelming and impossible. And I've, re I've reverted to planner pad, which lets me list only a few items per day. Um, so I'm calmer and I'm getting more accomplished in, in relation to what I'm trying to get accomplished. So that's kind of just an interesting thing along the side. Uh, echoes of Ken about loneliness. I love the visit. I recommend go, go see Ken. He's got a nice scene and he's fun to hang out with. So, and, he, and, and, and he not only has orange shoes, he has orange other stuff too. So, so recommended there. Um, uh, Jane and I are at the extreme end of the COVID management curve because of her immunocompromised situation. So we're lonely. And um, I'm watching the conference worlds crank back up again. And a lot of my younger colleagues are flying around, going places, and we're not doing that. It feels very weird and don't know that that's going to end very soon. Basically, you know, indoors without masks off the table for me. Yeah, I'm sorry point. about that. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'm holding personally responsible, Jerry Mikulski. So there you go. Excellent. Great. Uh, Just keep something else on my shoulders. Go, why don't you? You step, you step right into it. So yeah. um, one thing, sec second part of the check-in, um, for the first time in a while, I'm actually in a good mood about American democracy or whatever we call this mess, uh, coming partly off the Kansas uh, election this week. Mm -hmm. And I've been running around uh, everywhere I can saying, look, if you know, what if the Democrats actually ran hard on the issues people really cared about? They might actually win elections, might actually take the House rather than, you know, you know, rather than hope to hold on by fingernails. Uh, you know, what if you actually looked at where there are super majorities in this country uh, on a half a dozen critical issues and ran hard on them? So that'll be interesting to watch and see if that happens. Um, um, in terms of in terms of work focus, uh, we're moving forward on critical path capital. We're in interesting conversations with a couple of investor groups that are mission aligned, uh, as well as talent aligned. I've mentioned to you previously that we're looking for some private equity people with chops and heart because that's missing on our core team. And um, there are conversations happening that are heartening about that. Um, uh, and in parallel to that, we're diving into the nuts and bolts of taking this general idea of, of acquiring um, small and mid-sized companies and making them ecologically grounded and employee owned and community rooted to saying, okay, well, like, what does that mean? What would that look like in a particular sector in say the Northern California market? And so we're diving in and looking at databases and looking at companies and trying to figure out if this idea actually makes sense 
uh, and then we will start talking with uh, with business owners who are near retirement or thinking about retirement and thinking about an exit. Um, turns out that uh, not only not only are half the business or half the half the jobs in the country are in the small and medium sized businesses. Uh, something like half of those are owned by boomers near retirement, and mm -hmm. half of those folks don't have exit plans. Yeah, it's amazing, and 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 succession which planning. Has, doesn't which happen. has an enormous, and often doesn't happen, and uh, and that has an enormous potential economic uh, development implication for the communities these businesses are in, because a lot of jobs could just go away, and then that ripples. So. Um, yeah. This is a very interesting blend for me of the kind of this you know, strategic private equity focus with big social and environmental ripples potential if we can pull it off. So um, I'm, I'm having a blast, uh, but I'm going from the part which is lots of fun to talk about to roll up, you know, deep elbows deep into the shit of the detailed work of, you know, figuring it out and testing ideas to see if they work. Thanks, Gil. That's lovely. And thanks for inspiring me to put up a web photograph as well. Um, Stacey. If I could just mention something really important to what Gil said about um, Kansas and our political system. I don't remember where I read it, where I heard it, whatever, but the important part to that win is that it happened because of canvassing Republicans and independents. And I think that's really key. Absolutely. There's a lot of common ground out there if we actually just have the conversations. Dave, to your comment, ESOPs, yeah, ESOPs, co-ops, Perpetual employee trust, various approaches to, have, to having more shared ownership. I mean, the point back to the value conversation of earlier is how do we enable people who generate value to share in more of the value that they create? And I'm and I'm happy to have the value conversation with Grace or anybody else wants to have it. I've been playing in that sandbox for a long time, looking at value, value streams, and value networks, and value leakage and value enhancement and the subjectivity of value. And, um, There's also an invisible, invisible value is a nifty topic as well. Yeah, Daniel Daniel Aronson talks sort of about it in terms of submerged value and has a book coming out next year called The Value of Values, um, hmm. which is a partly high level concept, but very nuts and bolts, nitty gritty about case examples throughout business of massive, massive value that just people don't see and don't pay attention to. Cool, thank you. Um, Mike, if you're around and wanna jump in, we can kind of complete the loop. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, your timing is perfect. I just got out of the car and I'm now safe to, to, to talk. Awesome. Very happy news. I just got back from an uh, incredible vacation in Oregon and Washington. And one of the high points was seeing Jerry in April in uh, an Andean restaurant in Portland. Um, yeah. It's also good to see family, and it was good to see just the the world outside the Beltway, and the the, the very different uh, worldviews that you see in a place like Portland and Seattle, and particularly Olympia. That's the capital of Washington State, but it's also this um, really oddball collection of different cultures jammed into a, a city of about 100,000 people. So that was that was delightful. And uh, again, very nice to see old friends, including some all the way back to high school. A couple of professional things. Uh, like Ken, I'm also dealing with foot pain, probably from too much running in barefoot shoes. But I, I have one answer to these problems, which is long bicycle rides. Tends to, at least for the Achilles tendonitis I'm dealing with, it seems to work pretty well. And the last thing, um, have a new book coming out in about uh, two weeks on how the Koreans and the Indians are developing new models for data management and data governance. Um, we worked with some colleagues in both countries and came up with some interesting stories to tell on how to process data. And we're starting a next project on Korea and India and how those two countries and other countries influence uh, digital standard making. And if anybody knows um, people they respect who have written interesting things about this topic, please let me know. A lot of the classic works on digital standard setting were done back in uh, 
uh, 1990s. Uh, not a lot of people go into this. It's kind of a boring topic for many people. Um, and it's very hard to um, understand the process without living it. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm up to. Uh, very, thank you, Jerry, very much again for uh, making time for me and also for a great dinner with you in April. It was lovely to see you both. Thank you. That's just great. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend this in-person thing. It's, um, <laughs> I, I think, massively underrated. I understand humans used to do it a lot, uh, but it's right now an endangered practice. So it's really old fashioned, sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Feeling it. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you. This has been really, uh, really fun. Next week is a topic week. And I, I think I'm, I think I'm going to, I think there's a topic brewing anyway that I know I want to stir the pot on, which is like uh, OGM's uh, mission objectives and activities. Uh, less, it's, I think it's a blend of the more abstract mission-y kind of stuff and the much more pragmatic, so wait, what are we doing and why and how are we doing it together kind of part. So let's so let's dive into that next week. Uh, Jerry, since we're already over, do you want to just go ahead and do a quick check-in since you're the last one? Oh, for me? Yeah. Um, gosh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm helping organize this event in New York in a couple weeks on August 16th. It's kind of a warm up event for a camp that Betaworks is running around tools for thinking. The camp is an accelerator that startups would apply to, and they will, they will process applications and accept probably seven, eight, or nine of them. Uh, and the camp would run 10 weeks and help accelerate those little companies into the space. Normally, these camp and they've done six camps in the past around audio, around synthetic media, around other kinds of stuff. I'm forget forgetting exactly what. Um, so they're, they're trying to sort of help boot, uh, boost a, a particular little domain of activity, in this case, tools for thinking, which is a squishy space to, uh, to define. Uh, normally, they uh, are looking for startup y kind of models where there'd be like a for profit typical model. But here, there's a lot of good conversation about the commons, about shared memory, about uh, not just individual tool, tools for thinking by yourself or for yourself, but rather tools for thinking together. <clears throat> and I don't know exactly yet, anybody with good ideas about this, let me know, how exactly to describe, promote, and assure that that part of this whole mission thrives. But it's a really important thing, obviously, for me, because OGM, because all these other sorts of things. Uh, but there's an opportunity here to, I, I hope everybody can tune in. It's to, uh, the, the session on the 16th is, uh, 1130 Eastern through 7 p.m. We're going to try to live stream all, all of it that we can. Uh, I think I think one of the sessions now is going to be me interviewing Esther. Because Esther's in New York and like we contacted her for a different thing and we suddenly were like, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we have Esther in? So uh, I'll be uh, interviewing her. I'm actually also on a couple of the panels sort of explaining my use of the brain and other sorts of stuff. <clears throat> but that's one of uh, one of a few uh, things that are brewing that I love to put in the group. Thanks for asking, Tim. Have you sent out the information about that meeting, Jerry? The, um, I put in the chat earlier and it's in the Plex that Pete just sent out a link to the August 16th session. So, so that's there. The rest of it is <clears throat> kind of materializing and I will be putting on uh, the OGM list and also in the Mattermost uh, basic sim, you know, more, uh, more links and more materials. And then I will be I will be in Manhattan for a couple of days around the 16th. So I will totally be there. Thanks. Cool. Awesome. Meet up with Mike and Stacy. I highly recommend it. And get uh, Wendy in there too. And Vincent. Yeah, exactly. Are you going to awesome. Manhattan to do that in person thingy? <laughs> uh, that yeah, I know. I'm just not used to it. So thanks everybody. Let's be careful out there. Just to mix messages. Ciao. Ciao.